stand by while NCLA cuts through the noise to signal abuse of administrative power. This is Administrative Static with Mark Chenoweth and John Vecchione. Welcome back to Administrative Static. Uh, John and I are delighted uh, to welcome a special guest uh, to the program for the next segment. Scott Shepard is a fellow at the National Center for Public Policy Research and director of its Free Enterprise Project. He's also a a client, uh, or the National Center for Public Policy Research, rather, is a client uh, of NCLA. But uh, today we've invited Scott on to talk about an interesting op-ed that uh, he wrote for Real Clear markets. And the title of this uh, op-ed is, If Carbon Emissions Are Material Disclosures, So Is Everything Else. Scott Shepard, welcome to Administrative Static. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Always great to talk to you. Well, tell us about, uh, tell us about this, uh, this rule. So uh, who is trying to, to force disclosure of carbon emissions and, and what else is in this uh, rule that troubles you? Well, pretty much everybody in the Biden administration is. That's one of their whole whole of government uh, initiatives. But um, but in this specific case, it's the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC uh, floated a rule that would require massive amounts of carbon and uh, carbon disclosure and very speculative amounts of carbon disclosure and carbon disclosure that would reach out to make companies uh, report on the, the carbon use by other companies, by energy providers that could provide their own carbon emissions uh, uh, information, and then even for final users to try to guess what, how much carbon they're going to use. use. So it, it's an absurd set of regulations. And more to the point, and the reason I wrote this, this piece is that the SEC has a statutory remit to require uh, material disclosures from companies, which is to say uh, disclosures that are material to the average Main Street investor who, unlike uh, Larry Fink's shop at BlackRock, can't demand any information they want from corporations. So it's, it's meant to help the Main Street uh, investor. And so in order for this uh, regulation to survive, and, the and SEC, material, oh, sorry, because we've got listeners who aren't necessarily uh, uh, savvy about uh, market regulation. What does sure. it mean if something's material? Yeah, material means that it, it matters in a relevant way to to the, the discussion. So in this case, and what material means, or, what's that? And the stock price. Well, right. So what the. What the, uh, the, the analysis is here is, does the average consumer who buys a little bit of GM want to know uh, all of the information being required? And is it going to matter in a relevant way to that, uh, that uh, ordinary investor's purchase? So as you say, is it going to affect the, the stock price in a, in a fairly direct way? And... <clears throat> The SEC has said, and it has to say, it has to argue, and then courts have to buy the idea that all of this carbon disclosure is materially relevant, is directly relevant to uh, the, the stock purchase decision by an investor. The problem that arises is that in order for, for this information to be material, to be relevant to the stock price, what has to happen is that the the SEC's uh, assumptions about carbon and that are based on uh, Mike Bloomberg's task force and UN modeling and assumptions made by the Sustainability Standards Board and others, that, that all of those assumptions are correct, which is to say you have to assume that the, the current administration's climate policies are going to stay in place forever such that if you invest in carbon producing assets, those are going to be, and this is a term of art, stranded assets that the company will, will lose its investment in. It doesn't come to grips with the fact that the next time there's a rotation in, in office, then all of those uh, regulations will be withdrawn the way they were under the Trump administration so that stranded asset analysis doesn't, uh, isn't relevant anymore. They don't grapple with the fact 
or or they assume away the problem that none of this carbon emission by Western corporations means anything at all if developing countries don't, as a practical matter, go along with decarbonization. And India and many other developing companies had said, we're, we're just not doing that. We're going to get wealthy um, the way you did, uh, West. And China sometimes runs its mouth at these uh, COP meetings that are held every couple of years, but then goes back to, and this is true of last year, um, adding more coal-emitting factories, uh, than, uh, uh, energy factories, than the whole West still has. Right, so, right. And, and, and right. I, I have to think that they show up at these conferences just to sort of goad the West into uh, making itself less competitive with China by, by raising the energy costs for the West. Meanwhile, China do what it, will do what it damn well pleases. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true, and it's true on so many fronts. The Chinese government in various ways funds our our collective Western and especially American mental breakdown, right? When you're running the military, uh, you're picking uh, uh, military officers because the guys look awfully fetching in stolen dresses or by other similar <laughs> criteria, then you're not going to have a, a, a terribly effective uh, military, and that's that's what they're doing. They're doing it on the climate front. They're going about building reliable energy. While uh, I don't uh, think you can blame China for that last one. I mean, that's <laughs> going to be internally done. But but I do. Uh, think, but the thing is, I, I thought you were going to go to TikTok with the TikTok in China well, versus or, or the TikTok fentanyl. here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, those those are exactly right. And I, I, I guess Britain wasn't a military officer, but but it does make the point. What what we're training about in the military is not how to beat China and other near peer adversaries. And and what we're doing uh uh with all this decarbonization is moving away from reliable energy toward uh unreliable energy that's nevertheless not clean. Green isn't clean, which uh I, is a snappy slogan I came up with. Uh, earlier in the week, so I wanted to bust that out. But, well, but um, with making the companies disclose these costs, I mean, if it, uh, you know, if if I want to go buy a pair of, uh, well, I guess I won't use a, a, a consumer product. If I want to buy a, a share of of Nike or a share of Adidas, maybe I maybe I do care. And if one of them is green and one of them's not, maybe I maybe I want to know that. What what's wrong with forcing these companies to disclose uh, this information? Well, a couple of things. First of all. Um, it's very expensive. The, these carbon disclosures would cost vastly more than all other disclosures that have ever been required by the uh, the SEC before combined. It's a, a price tag in, I think, the hundreds of billions of, uh, of dollars each year. And, it's, and that creates all sorts of problems like um, uh, consolidation of power in large companies because it increases the barriers to entry and compete. And so, of course, the giant companies like that because it increases the barriers to entry and com- competition. But it's, uh, it, it's one of those moves that seizes up the engines of, of entrepreneurship and productivity in the American the American economy. But additionally, and this is what I was, was talking about in my, my column, in order for these regulations to stand, some court will have to decide that material, that, that uh, uh, disclosures are material and so fit within the SEC's remit and can be, can be forced on companies by the SEC, even if any connection at all to a company's stock price is based on inference after inference and presumption after presumption, most of which are counterfactual. Why the thing about that, that why oh, sorry. Help? I was just going to ask, why isn't this compelled speech, Scott? This seems like, like forced speech to me. Well, I mean, it it is forced speech in the sense that um, <laughs> that they are requiring specific things be said, and that is that is a, a derivation from a deviation from how the SEC usually works. The SEC has has tended in the past to say, disclose material stuff, and then companies do that on their own. On their uh, by their own lights, by their own determination of which material, and if it turns out that they withheld things that uh, under under regular uh, standards or review really were material, then they get in trouble with the SEC and they get fined or, or other penalties. In this case, the the SEC is con- compelling them to say very specific things and very elaborate things, and to devise all sorts of models in order to make fairly random guesses. Uh, to, to answer these questions. Right. And uh, now, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. 
Well, I, I was just, this reminds me of the rule that, that the SEC had put out several years ago that got shot down uh, in the DC circuit, which was the conflict minerals rule where companies were supposed to disclose their entire uh, supply chain. And, and if anything, anywhere along the supply chain came from a, a conflict region, then they had to disclose that. And companies were saying, we don't know where this stuff came from. We just buy it from company Acme over here. We don't trace their whole supply chain. And and so SEC was going to make them disclose that that you know that something may or may not have come from a conflict region. And that DC <laughs> circuit said, no, 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 no. You can't make them do that. They're not in the in the tracking the entire length of their supply chain business, and you can't force them to say something that might not be true, uh, i.e., that something came from a conflict region when it when it didn't. It seems like that precedent would be really relevant uh, to to this rule. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, especially when some of the mechanisms that are required. Uh, one is that they they try to calculate the amount of carbon that would have been created but for the decarbonization efforts they've undertaken. And not only is that speculative, and it will require lots, it's a, it's a full, full employment act for statistical modelers, but it's also gibberish. I mean, of course, companies are going to say, oh, we've saved, this is like jobs created or saved under the Obama administration. We've saved 18 trillion cubic whatevers of, of carbon emissions. Yeah, this is shovel-ready jobs for actuaries, maybe. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, so where can people find this article, uh, Scott? Tell us, tell us your website. Uh, it was at Real Clear Markets uh, a couple of weeks ago. But you also, if you check out freeenterpriseproject.org, um, we – we put up uh, uh, on our blog, we put up uh, uh, our page, put up our, all the stories that we have published. So it should be available fairly easily there. Terrific. Scott Shepard, S-H-E-P-A-R-D from the National Center for Public Policy Research. Thanks for being with us on Administrative Static. Thank you. Welcome back to Administrative Static. We're here with uh, a, another special guest on, on the program uh, today, Senior Litigation Counsel Russ Ryan, one of our colleagues here at NCLA. Uh, welcome to Administrative Static, Russ. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, so Russ uh, has, has authored uh, an amicus brief uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, for NCLA in a case called Harry C. Calcutt III versus the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. In this case, uh, so a petition for for a writ of certiorari has been filed. Uh, The case came up out of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and this amicus brief was written in support of of cert. So maybe the first question I should ask, uh, Russ, is why should the Supreme Court grant cert in this case? Uh, Well, Calcutt's raised two two good issues um, and good reasons to grant cert. Uh, one, which is an issue we didn't write on, um, but the Sixth Circuit panel essentially found that the FDIC final order against Mr. Calcutt was riddled with some legal errors, um, and Calcutt claims that the panel then ignored the Supreme Court's um, ruling in a case called SEC against Chenery back in the early 40s, I think. Uh, which basically says if a reviewing court finds legal error in an administrative final judgment, uh, it should set that final order aside and remand it back to the agency to see if there's some other permissible legal ground to uphold it. Here, the court, And the Sixth Circuit didn't do that here. No, they went on and they basically then took it upon themselves to search for some alternative legal theory that the FDIC could have used had it thought about it. Um, And um, there was a dissenting judge in the Sixth Circuit who said, no, we 
we're supposed to remand it back. Um, Calcutt's arguing that. Calcutt's arguing um, that it should have been sent back to the agency. And one of the interesting things here is that the government, after the panel decision, the government essentially conceded, no, that the court shouldn't have gone and looked for another legal basis. Hmm. It, the government essentially agrees with Calcutt. And so um, Calcutt asked for a, um, a, a withdrawal, whatever the, the term of art is, a stay of the mandate and a recall of the Sixth Circuit mandate uh, in part on that for that reason. And Justice Kavanaugh granted it back in September. So I think that bodes well for Calcutt that... Um, that the mandate was stayed. At least on that issue, both parties seem to agree that the Sixth Circuit should not have gone further than just saying there was legal error. Okay. And then there's the issue that you did write about. So what's that yes. one? So uh, Calcutt has also raised the issue of whether the FDIC administrative law judge who adjudicated his case uh, is enjoys too much protection from removal by the president. And that's an issue that's of great interest to us and several of our clients in other cases. Yeah, we've so looked at this in the in the SEC context and the FTC context. And I think even the CPSC yeah. context. Now we've got the FDIC, Perfect. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Is it? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so the, the the commissioners who run this are are not uh, at will employees. Is that right? Uh, the, well, the board of the FDIC is five presidentially appointed. People who um, I can't be removed. Yeah, I think they to... share the normal okay. um, removal protection. The ALJs then have a second, third, or fourth layer in this case that they can't be removed without going through a lot of hoops and proving some type of malfeasance. Um, so, what the Sixth Circuit said uh, did on that issue is. Um, it basically said, well, we're not sure that they're, that the ALJ is, has too much removal protection, but we're not going to decide the issue anyway, because even if we agreed with you, Mr. Calcutt, uh, we can't give you any kind of remedy because you didn't show us that the result would have been any different had this ALJ been removable at will. Um, and how, how can one show that? How can you show after the fact that the judgment would have been different if the judge hadn't uh, enjoyed unlawful protections from removal? I mean, it seems like an impossible standard yeah. to meet to me. In theory, if the president had um, made a public statement that this particular ALJ is not doing what I think he should be doing, uh, I wish I could remove him, but unfortunately, my hands are tied. That would be the perfect <laughs> unicorn case, of gotcha. course. But if, you're right; it's it's never you're never going to find that unicorn. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, when's the last time a president made such a statement about an ALJ? <laughs> Probably never. I would guess. Right. I mean, you'd you'd rarely find that even for a more prominent member of the the bureaucracy. Um, so yeah, that that's a problem in itself. Um, but it's even more of a problem for a litigant like Calcutt, who was not in a federal court where you can get broad-based discovery and try to prove that. He was basically playing defense in an administrative home court, basically, with limited discovery and an adjudicator who had no competence to decide the removal protection issue. So there was no way he could even get discovery on the issue. But you know, you, you're hinting at a bigger problem, I think, in yeah. these removal protection cases, which right. is what is the remedy? And and even the Supreme Court has been, in my view, somewhat stingy on the remedies when it's found removal protection problems. Um, but now we know that if the Supreme Court is stingy about it, so at least one lower court, the Sixth Circuit, has decided, well, if there's no remedy, then we don't even have to decide whether this is unconstitutional or not. But But to me, the problem is, you need to decide if it's unconstitutional, because if it is, you ought to at least be able ex ante to stop yourself from having to go through the proceeding in front of the unlawful ALJ. Yeah, if it has not, even if it only has sort of a salutary effect and it's kind of a pyrrhic victory, 
at least it puts the agency on notice that, hey, you're violating the Constitution, and then future litigants can, uh, or presumably if you if you assume the agency uh, is going to obey the courts, they do something to to stop what they're doing, you know. Right. To but, fix the problem. But, it's, could. but essentially, it seems like the Sixth Circuit said, well, but that's not going to help Calcut. So that that's not a remedy we're going to order because that remedy is about other people in the future, not Calcut. And therefore, it's irrelevant to this proceeding. That that seems a, a kind of a uh, an unfortunate take. Yeah. And, and what puzzles me is, I mean, the, the obvious remedy in a case like this would be set aside the tainted final order of the FDIC. That would be satisfactory relief sure. to Mr. Calcutt. Um, Even if he had to go through it again or something like that. Yeah, that, that would be second best maybe. But um, Calcutt, uh, you know, personally doesn't care whether the court declares the whole administrative system of the FDIC void and invalidates it um, it's good enough for him if the court says, look, this thing looks like it's tainted by a constitutional problem. We're going to set it aside and tell you to go back and figure it out. Sure. That would be perfectly satisfactory relief for Mr. Calcutt, I would think. Yeah. And, and without that sort of disciplinary uh, kind of rod, if you will, by the courts, I mean, what, what incentive is there after this decision for the FDIC to change anything? Yeah. And we, you know, in some of our other cases, we've um, had this situation where you, you can't go and get the uh, removal protection problem declared unlawful beforehand. Although we may get some relief. We're, we're trying on to that change that. Yeah. Cochran, I, I have a question. Cochran. Yeah. Can the FDIC, can they change this of their own or does Congress have to change it or does the court have to say you can't do that anymore? See, I, yeah, I think that's a great point, John. I, I don't think there's an easy fix for this. I think that's why the agencies are fighting tooth and nail and they're trying to postpone any ruling on this issue for as long as possible because um, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but for the FDIC ALJs, it's even more complicated to remove them than even SEC ALJs. And it's a, you know, a, a, we, a web of statutory removal protections for various levels of bureaucrats. And, you know, I haven't studied it in detail, but just looking at it and thinking about it, it seems like this would require some congressional action and not not simple congressional action. It would, it would yes. require some major surgery, I think. Oh, what a tangled web we weave <laughs> when first we practice two relieve from <laughs> removal right. uh, these uh, these ALJs. So another argument you make uh, in the brief, Russ, is that uh, this decision below disincentivizes removal protection challenges. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, the, uh, the Supreme Court on a number of occasions has explicitly recognized that um, one of the best vehicles to keep the elected branches in check on separ separation of powers issues and removal protection is one of them, um, is individual citizens challenging it because the elected branches don't always have an incentive to, um, to raise these issues. And in fact, some of the leading cases like Lucia, uh, Free Enterprise Fund, Cochran. Uh, Ryder, Cochran, <laughs> um, they're all brought by individuals or individuals or small businesses. They're not brought by Congress and not um, disputes between parts of the federal um, government. So the court has frequently said we need to incentivize individuals to raise these questions. And yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think that's all we're going to have time for uh, today, Russ, but uh uh, again, the case is Calcutt v. FDIC, and we sure encourage to grant grant cert here. Hopefully, they'll listen to what you have to say. Thank you.